In this experiment, the divers must compare the present digit to the digit that was presented to them previously and decide whether both digits were either both odd or both even. Cramped quarters inside the chamber require that essential items like food and clothing be passed to the divers through pressure locks. Being enclosed in such a small space with no privacy over a long period of time could result in certain effects on personality. Dr. Patrick Logue, who is interested in this and other possible changes, conducted a series of psychological tests focusing on the emotional and cognitive aspects dependent on the integrity of the central nervous system. The test battery that we came up with uh, tested memory, new learning ability, constructional abilities, rapid responding, concentration, alertness, anxiety, depression, and general personality factors. There were several things that were of importance here. The intelligibility problem, uh, the need to have multiple forms of each test, the need to have valid, reliable tests, and tests that made some kind of sense in the real world. Um, all of the divers were measured pre-dive so that we had some idea of their general abilities prior to. And then we did multiple testing during the course of the dive itself. We made use of the two chambers of the dive. We had one examiner at the lower porthole, one examiner at the upper port porthole, and a sort of a floater psychologist in between to kind of coordinate the movement of the divers from one aspect of the bell to the other. In that way, we could occasionally isolate people, give them a test, and make sure uh, that their test performance did not influence other people's test performance. Now, one week after the Atlantis III dive began, pressure inside the chamber is 65 times that of normal. Compression comes to a scheduled halt. Steve Porter's assessment of his condition reflects the general condition of all three divers. They are in remarkably good shape. Uh, there's been no external tremor that I can ascertain, except in all that I've spent in tremor. Uh, it's a little harder for me to breathe than here, but still no, no serious problems, just that they got to the stuff they're going to have some work from breathing anyway. For visiting research diver Martin Garrar, the performance of Porter, Whitlock, and Kramer at 650 meters provides a sharp contrast to his incapacitated condition during the 660 meter British AMTE dive of October 1980. Yeah. Everybody ready? Start. Atlantis divers have reported a slight difficulty in breathing. Internal or intention tremors have been experienced and there is now some loss of concentration. But the debilitating signs and symptoms of HPNS are being controlled. In addition, the 10% nitrogen content of the trimix gas does not seem to be causing any undue ill effects. In the coming days, while the divers are held at this depth, Garrard will witness an even more stunning display of diver performance. It is the ninth day of the dive. Lynn Whitlock has been chosen by the respiratory research team to undergo the first of three nine-hour experiments. However, prior to this strenuous exercise, an extremely difficult procedure must be performed. An arterial catheter needle has to be placed in the arm of the test subject. Doctors John Salzano and Enrico Camparisi monitor the progress of the first arterial line placement. Complicated enough on the surface, this task is being carried out successfully at 650 meters. Over a three-day period, 
each diver will go below G chamber to another specially rigged chamber where the team will conduct a series of steady state exercises using a bicycle ergometer. This is an attempt to quantify the amount of work of which they are capable. The oxygen consumption and CO2 elimination for a given work rate will be measured as well as a number of measurements to evaluate lung function. One goal of these experiments is to determine if a direct compression to 650 meters has physiological effects different from those in Atlantis II, in which compression to this depth was begun after the subjects had spent five days at 460 meters. At the end of the grueling day-long experiment will come showers, dinner, and yet another test of the diver's ability to function efficiently at this great depth. Setting up three bunks in the restricted space of the chamber requires a kind of mental fortitude and physical coordination which never seems to be plotted on the official graphs and charts. Early next morning, before starting another respiratory exercise, blood samples are drawn to provide researcher Dr. Judith Anderson the opportunity to perform important hematologic studies. The goal being to ascertain whether some of the circulating cellular elements in blood may be reflective of some of the changes that go on in the central nervous system uh, in producing the high pressure nervous syndrome. We've been looking at uh, cellular elements such as red cells and platelets and white cells to see if these might provide us markers a little more accessible than the central nervous system to study some of the, the uh, ion fluxes and membrane changes. We've been additionally interested in, in clotting factors and the changes uh, in clotting factors involved during uh, compression and bottom time of in trimix diving. And this dive has provided us a, an excellent opportunity to study that over a long period of time. They're centrifuging uh, samples at depth to rid the plasma of cellular elements that might be activated during decompression to the surface and might produce artifactual changes. Uh, they're additionally using fluorocarbon, FC80, as a gas trap. We're using it in volume excess and combining it with whole blood samples that have been anticoagulated appropriately uh, to allow the sample to off-gas into the fluorocarbon and to spare the sample the, the damage that would be created by gas coming out of solution on the way to the surface during a rapid decompression. By 10 a.m., another arterial line is being inserted in the arm of today's respiratory test subject, Eric Kramer. Steve Porter's steady hands have now placed two arterial lines without a problem. These lines will enable measurement of arterial carbon dioxide and oxygen. The cardiorespiratory team will also be recording a subjective evaluation for breathlessness or dyspnea. The symptoms of disabling exercise-induced dyspnea were significantly reduced when divers of Atlantis I switched between a heliox breathing gas to trimix while on the ergometer. It is believed that Trimix 10, while ameliorating HPNS, may also account for this lessening of dyspnea, despite higher work of breathing due to the increased gas density. It is one day later. These scenes of Steve Porter document a performance on the ergometer which surprised everyone at the lab. He is now into the fifth minute of a six-minute exercise. He will not finish the entire run, but before he stops, Porter will have performed up to 240 watts of work, breathing a gas 18 times as dense as air. Steve will complain of some breathing difficulty, but not as the sole limitation in performing the exercise. At the end of each respiratory study, a gas analysis of the collected arterial blood is made. Measurement is done with equipment inside the lower chamber by one of the divers as a technician on the outside directs the procedure. Two hours later, the most anticipated event of each day finally arrives. It is small payment for the intense work of today, but still much enjoyed and surpassed in appreciation 